Good morning. Today's extended convocation speaker, Mr. Pridmore, has spoken to the sophomores, juniors, and seniors before. His book, From Gangland to Promised Land, some of you have read and been astounded by. Mr. Pridmore is here to speak tomorrow at the men's conference, which takes place at St. Lawrence. Just chatting with Mr. Pridmore, we came across the fact we have a lot of friends in common. He said that Monsignor Armitage, the English priest who came here and told about the burglar who had his earprint, is like, oh yeah, I know the guy, yeah. Um, many people know Mr. Pridmore. Uh, those of you who've been to Nicaragua, Father Augustine is one of his friends because he worked in the East End with him. Mr. Pridmore is going to give a very uh, captivating speech about how a man of such repute becomes a man of great holiness and virtue. Please welcome Mr. Pridmore. Good morning, everyone. Uh, maybe you'll join me in a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, Lord Jesus, we ask you to help us to see ourselves as you see us, without judgment or condemnation, but with mercy and understanding. And we ask this through the intercession of Mary, our mother. Mary, take us into the parts of our heart, the rooms of our heart, where we don't like ourselves or accept ourselves, and show us that it's through our very weakness that Christ's strength is made perfect. Help us to accept those parts of ourselves as you accept them. As we pray, how Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. And we invoke our guardian angels that all the seed God sows here today might fall on good soil in our hearts. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits us here, ever this day be at our side, to light, to guard, to rule and guide. And finally, for those of us who've made confirmation, we would have chosen a saint's name on that day of our confirmation. I was confirmed when I was 27, and the saint I chose was St. Thomas More, and he's helped me immensely in my life. So maybe you can think of the saint you chose so that they might pray and intercede from their places in heaven for you. And if there's anyone here who hasn't been confirmed, it's something I'd highly recommend because it's where you receive all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But if you haven't been confirmed, think of your favourite saint. And because I live in Ireland now, one of my favourite saints is St. Patrick. But there's many to choose from. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. And I ask St. Therese of Lisieux to bring down the fire of the Holy Spirit from heaven so that we might be set ablaze with that same Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was a father and son, and they had a great passion, and their passion was collecting great works of art. And they established a collection which became world-renowned. They even had Picassos and Rembrandts. And this collection was known throughout the world. And often they would sit in their gallery and they would just look at these great masters' paintings and it would bring great joy to their heart. Well, when the Vietnam War came along, the son was called up to fight in the Vietnam War. And because his father was a man of prayer, he prayed for his son. But tragically, his son was killed. But he was actually killed 
saving five other soldiers. And even though his son had died virtuously, it didn't bring much comfort to the father's heart who longed for his son to be back with him. And each time he'd sit in his gallery, he didn't have the same joy of looking at these paintings. After about a year after his son's death, there was a knock on the door and he opened the door and it was one of the soldiers that his son had saved. And he went on to tell the father how his son had been a great friend of his and he had actually painted a picture of his son. And when the father opened this picture which he had brought with him as a gift for the father, he saw that this painting really captured his son's eyes and the love in his son's heart. And he placed it in pride of place in the gallery. A few years later, the father died and there was collectors from all over the world who came for the auction of these pictures. And the first picture that the auctioneer held up was the picture of the son. And the well collectors started complaining that we haven't come for these amateur paintings, we've come for the masterpieces. But the auctioneer persisted in trying to sell this painting. At the back, there was a gardener who worked on the estate and he loved the son and he loved the father. And he offered $200 for this painting. And the auctioneer asked if there was any advance and because there wasn't, he brought the hammer down. And then he started closing up his case. And the well collector said, well, what's going on? We've traveled for many, many hours to get here. Where are the masterpieces? And the auctioneer said, the father left specific instructions in his will. Whoever receives the son receives everything. Whoever receives the son receives everything. It's a true story. In my own life, I had no concept that Jesus Christ was everything. I was baptised a Catholic, but I was never brought up as a Catholic. I never went to Catholic school, I never went to church. At the age of 10, I came home a normal night, and my parents told me that I had to choose who I wanted to live with, because they were getting divorced, and I couldn't choose. Because the two people I love most in this world had crushed me inside. So I think I made an unconscious decision that I wouldn't love anymore. Because I really thought if you don't love, you don't get hurt. My mum ended up having a nervous breakdown and went to psychiatric hospital and my dad remarried. And my stepmum thought the best way of bringing up a kid was beating them senseless each day. So that was my upbringing. At the age of about 13, I started stealing because I wanted someone to take notice of the pain that I was in. I expect I wanted someone to tell me that they loved me. But because my dad was a policeman, it just added to the beatings. At 15, I was put in detention centre, which is like a youth prison, and I actually thought it was better in there than being at home. So I left home at 15. And my only qualification was stealing, so that's what I did. At 19, I was in prison again, and there was another change in me. See, the way I dealt with all the abuse I suffered as a kid is I just turned that abuse into anger. So I was always fighting. A friend of mine, who was a priest, who was working with Mother Teresa, where you take the dying off the streets, she came across this... He came across this old man who had been on the streets for years. And as he knelt down at this old man, he said, we'd I take you back to the mother house, and we'd I feed you, and we'd I clothe you, and we'd I give you life. 
And this old man spat in my priest friend's face. And he said to him, I offer you life and you spit at me. And he walked away in disgust. Well, when he got back to the mother house, there was a 17 year old girl there. And she too was very angry and very bitter. She had been betrayed by the very people who were meant to love her. And one of these sisters was trying to help this girl but this girl was just screaming at the sister to get away from her, even scratching the sister. And this priest was about to go and help this sister when Mother Teresa walked in. And Mother Teresa saw the incident and she walked up to this girl and she took her in her arms and she hugged her. And she held her for over an hour. And at the end of this embrace, this girl was crying and smiling. And my priest friend said, if only I had the faith of Mother Teresa, when that man had spat at me, I would have hugged him to show him that someone loved him. As I say, when I was lashing out fighting, I was put on 23 hour solitary confinement. And I seriously thought about taking God's greatest gift, my own life. But God must have been there because I didn't take my own life. But I came out of there more angry and more bitter than ever. And I thought, what you want out of this world, you take, because no one gives you anything. And I started bouncing around the East End and West End clubs of London. And I met some guys who had everything. They had the best cars, the best girls. They walked into a club and everyone stopped, because they had disrespect, all for the wrong reasons. And I wanted that respect. I wanted that power. So I started working for these guys. And the first job they give you is they tell you to go and pick up a Land Rover from Dover Harbour. And they tell you where it was and give you the keys. And you go over and you pick up this Land Rover and you drive it back and you get paid five grand. And you knew that it was full of drugs. And after a while, they trusted you enough that you were setting up your own jobs on your own scams and in a very short space of time I had a penthouse apartment I was earning so much money I couldn't spend it I had the sports cars but inside there was this overwhelming sense of emptiness because nothing satisfied me nothing fulfilled me and because of this emptiness I looked for what the world offered I was on crack cocaine, smoking dope like it was going out of fashion, drinking really heavy. I was also very promiscuous. By the way, I'm not that going to a big spill with drugs, but I've taken every drug there is. And I've met a few people who think they can handle drugs, especially a nice little joint. One of my friends, when he was 15, he was given a joint at school And after a few months of smoking this joint, he moved on to the next drug. By the age of 16, he was on heroin. When I met him, he had all these chunks out of his arm, like a load of piranhas had been eating him. I said, what's going on with your arm? He said, I hated myself so much because I couldn't get off that drug. I used to bite chunks out of myself. I used to bite chunks out of myself. They don't tell you those nice little stories when they want you to smoke a spliff. If you take drugs, you'll destroy your life. And I've met so many people who thought they can handle drugs, never. But I've met so many drugs that destroy people. I was also very promiscuous, and I used that as one of the painkillers. Sometimes I'd wake up with girls and I wouldn't even know their name. But the more drugs I took and the more promiscuous I became, the more my soul seemed to die inside. I came in this normal night and I became aware of a voice speaking to me in my heart. And I knew that voice was God. And I knew I was dying there and then. And I knew I was going to hell. And I cried out for another chance. Not because I was sorry, but I didn't want to go to hell. And as I walked out of that apartment, I said the first prayer I'd ever said. 
I said up to now all I've done is take from you God now I want to give and as I said that prayer that emptiness which had always filled my heart was suddenly filled with the love of God the Holy Spirit and in that moment I knew God could love someone like me whereas I'll be honest with you up to that moment I always thought I was worthless and it didn't matter whether I lived or died but in that moment I knew it did matter because God not only loved me, but he had a plan for me. The only person I knew out of faith was my mum. And I didn't see a lot of her in them days. I might bung her an expensive present when I felt guilty. But this night I went round and told her what had happened to me. She said to me she had prayed for me every single day of my life. And nine days before this, she had prayed a novena which is obviously nine days of prayer, to the patron saint of hopeless cases, Saint Jude. And it was on the ninth day of my mum's novena that I truly believe I heard the voice of God speak to me in my heart. My stepdad who died the other year, he gave me my first Bible. I just opened it up randomly. And one of the first pages it fell on was the story of the prodigal son. And I knew it was me. I knew everything I had taken from God, I had just wasted. And I also realized in the same way that he was starving, I was starving. I wasn't starving for food, and my money had run out. But you know whatever mask you wear at school to get your friends to like you, when you go home and you shut your bedroom door, there's no one to impress, is there? We haven't got to pretend we can be real. Well, I'd spent my whole life trying to impress everyone else. And I'd never once thought, who am I in the eyes of God? Do you know, I ended up going to this retreat. And it was at that retreat I did something which I never thought I'd do in my life. I went to confession. And that confession completely changed my life. Do you know, I was completely honest. I left nothing out during that confession. And it was like a transformation. I knew that I was forgiven. Father John Armitage, who you would have heard about recently, he lives in the park, well, he used to, now he's in the Walsingham. But before he was in an East End parish, quite a rough place in Canning Town. And one morning he told me, that as he opened his door, there was a guy lying there and groaning. And as he looked at him, he couldn't see much damage, but on his shirt, there was a little bit of blood. And he decided to call an ambulance. And when the ambulance driver arrived, the paramedic, he immediately started panicking. And he said to Father John, thank God you called an ambulance. And Father John said, why? And he said, because this guy's been stabbed with a wasp stiletto. A wasp stiletto, I used to carry one when I was a gangster, is a very thin, long blade. So on the outside, it looks like there's no damage. But on the inside, there's horrendous damage going on. And it's a bit like sin. On the outside, I look like anyone else. But on the inside, I was wrecked inside. Do you know, I remember when I was seven years old, it's a totally true story. I got a rosebush thorn embedded in my hand. And I was petrified of my mum getting the needle and start digging, you know, like mums do when you get a splinter. So for three days, I hid it from my mum. And I think I was having a bath or saying on the third day, and she saw this little splinter. And within one second, she took this rosebush thorn out of my hand. I thought, what an idiot. Why didn't I just go up to her and say, Mum, it's hurting? Because the moment she took that thorn out, there was no more pain. And for three days, I couldn't even sleep. If I had a little baby sitting on this uh, podium, and none of you know the baby, but the baby's crying because he's got a little fawn in his foot. 
Every one of us out of our compassion had thou come up and removed the form from his foot. But say we loved that baby more than we loved their own life. Say we'd rather die in agony than have anything happen to that baby. But when Jesus looks on us, the many loves and adores, he knows every sin we've committed. And he sees those sins as forms, piercing our hearts, causing us pain. And he longs to remove them. But the only way he can remove them is if we give him permission. St. Mother Teresa's most favourite prayer, give God permission. And every time you go to confession and you're completely honest, he's not content with taking away your sins. He wants to fill you up with every grace and blessing. When I came away from that confession, I wanted to dance, I felt so free. And I pray that at some point over the next weeks as you lead up to Easter, you make the best confession you've ever made. And maybe those sins that you've never had the courage to confess are the very sins that are stopping you knowing Jesus' personal love for you. Because I must say this, after that confession, I could not stop crying because I felt so loved. Do you know, I cried for three days. And do you know, one of the greatest fears which nearly stopped me going to that confession was what the priest might think of me. And when I looked into the priest's eyes, do you know what he was doing? He was crying. He wasn't judging me. He was Jesus to me. He was rejoicing because I was set free. Then there was a mass. Now I was never brought up as a Catholic. So when they started saying that this white thing was meant to be Jesus, I thought I was on the wacky farm. Because he doesn't look like Jesus. He looks like a piece of bread. And they kept on saying, this is our Lord. And I kept on thinking, you are nutty. But at this Mass, I said a simple prayer, and I said, if this is true to you, Jesus, then show me, because I don't understand. As I received Jesus on that day, the only way I can describe it to you is every good feeling I ever felt in my life, including how I felt when I walked out of that flat, including how I felt when I walked away from confession, was magnified and magnified. And I knew that was Jesus. Body, blood, soul and divinity. Not because anyone had taught me out of a book, but I had asked Jesus and he had personally shown me. Do you know, I was in Paris recently and I was doing some talks for this guy who's very famous around the world. His name is Jean Vanier. He set up these large communities where disabled people live with able-bodied people and they pray and work together. He said about a young boy who came into their community who was 16 years old. His name was Eric. He was deaf, blind and dumb. And he had been cocooned in this darkness since he was two years old. And he had gone from one institution to the other. And when he came into their community, Jean Vanier said he had never met a child who was so in terror all the time. No matter what they did, no one could seem to reach this child. He was in utter terror. And one of the boys in his community called Philip, who was actually a Down syndrome boy, he said, why don't we take Eric and place him in front of Jesus? Because every day they used to have adoration in this community. So the same Jesus we receive at Mass is put in a monstrance and you spend time in front of him. So Jean Vanier said they used to carry Eric up in his wheelchair to the chapel and they used to place him in his presence. And he watched over the weeks and the months as this boy's life was totally transformed. 
our humble God, who comes to us in the form of bread, was able to reach into Eric's heart, that heart so cocooned in darkness and fear, and completely transform him. And Eric is completely without fear now. And Jean Vanier said in this talk, it's only our God who's so humble, who could reach into Eric's pain and transform his pain into joy. And this kid is completely unrecognisable. Every time we receive Jesus, he gives us everything he has. His body, blood, soul and divinity. Every time we receive Jesus, he brings us every grace and blessing. Every time we receive Jesus, we start becoming more like him. I go to Mass every day, not because I'm holy, but because I want to be holy. And that's where I receive the greatest gift on earth. And I pray that you really have your eyes open, if you haven't already, to the wonder of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. I left that retreat and I started working with a little nun, a world famous little nun called Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I expect she taught me how to love again, how to love myself and how to love others. One of the biggest things that struck me about this little nun was she was fearless. You know, I was meant to work with some of the hardest men in London, and most of them were scared of their own shadow. I wouldn't sit with my back to a door in a public place in case someone come in and shot me. And here was this little tiny nun who had no fear. And when I reflected why she had no fear, do you know what I think it was? Pure love drives out all fear. Pure love drives out all fear. And she was so filled with God's love that there was no room for fear anymore. And the more I've opened my heart to that love, the less fear there's been in my life. Like I know I told some of you this before, but when I was at school, I was dyslexic. I couldn't read or write. And they didn't know what dyslexia was, so they just said, you're stupid. So I think I made a lot of bad choices because I believed that lie. Since I've opened my heart to God, I've wrote four books. Two of them are bestsellers. One's an international bestseller in ten different languages. Before I opened my heart to God, I was asked to speak at my brother's wedding as his best man. There was a hundred guests at this wedding. I couldn't put three words together. I was a babbling idiot. I could not speak in public. Since I've opened my heart to God, I've spoke to well over three million people around the world. Just the other year I spoke at World Youth Day in Sydney in the presence of Pope Benedict to half a million young people. Didn't even butt an eyelid. Last year I was in 20 different countries, on television in some of those countries. I think when we open our heart to God, and when we really step out to give him our lives, he shows us what he created us for. God has a plan for every single one of us. Do you know, I was over in Canada not so long ago, and the person who got me over there is probably a billionaire. And his eldest daughter, Major, who's 18 years old, I said to her, what are you going to do in the way of uh, your vocation? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, have you asked God? And she said, how do I ask God? And I said, the same way as you asked me. You just say, what, what should I do? What did you create me for? Do you know, two months after I had this conversation with her, she emailed me. And she said, you know, I know what God wants me to be. He wants me to be a doctor. And I emailed her back and I said, how do you know? And she said, I was asking him for the two months every day. And I was watching a soap and I just knew in my heart it was about doctors. This is what I should be. I knew. 
A lot of you are going to be making decisions of what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I really hope and pray that you're asking God what he created you for. Because I've never been so happy, I've never been so fulfilled, and I've never been so utterly thankful of God of what he's called me to. And if someone had told me that I'd be doing this, travelling around the world, sharing my story, I would have laughed my head off. And also I would have laughed if it was to fulfil me. And yet I've never been so fulfilled. Only God knows what's going to make you happy. So I really pray that you ask him. Just lastly, when I was praying for this talk, there was a couple of things I felt the Holy Spirit asked me to share. One was that after I found God, there was still a lot of anger in me. And I ended up going to a prayer house in Scotland. And in this prayer house, we prayed a lot of um, rosaries each day. We was praying the rosary. And we also spent a lot of time in adoration, like I was saying, in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And during this time of prayer, I really felt God saying that a big part of the anger in me was because I couldn't forgive. Because I couldn't forgive the people who had really hurt me. And one person who had really been cruel to me as a kid was my stepmom. So I thought I'd better start praying for her. So I'd say, Lord, bless her, but make sure she suffers. Well, after a few months, it was like God took away to make sure she suffers. And I was just saying, Lord, bless her. And you know, I learned just the other year that my stepmom was baptised a Catholic. She made her first Holy Communion and Confession. And she now goes to Mass every day. And I really believe that part of her conversion was a part of my forgiveness. So if there's people here who really struggle to forgive, ask God to help you to forgive. And maybe through that beautiful sacrament of confession, he can set you free. A girl who's in community with me now called Catherine, her father was very unfaithful to her mother when she was growing up. And she had a real hatred for her father because he had destroyed the family. He had never asked for her forgiveness. But when she brought her father to her confession, she felt this rock being removed from her heart and it transformed her. And you know, she was really able to forgive her dad and actually start loving him. And I think he's changed dramatically and converted dramatically because of her love for him. The other thing that I felt the Holy Spirit asked me to share is, I've been with God some 27 years now. In fact, it was my birthday yesterday, or the day before yesterday, day before yesterday. And so I've been 27 years without God, and now I've been 27 years with God, because I'm 54. And so the last two days, I'm actually in credit with God. So you're the second talk I've gave where I'm in credit with God, if that makes any sense at all. But I've been with God 27 years. About seven years ago, I realised I was addicted to gambling. And even though I didn't gamble every day, when I did gamble, I knew it took me away from God. So I made a promise to God that with his grace, I won't gamble anymore. For four years, I didn't gamble. I wanted to gamble, but I just didn't gamble. Three years ago, I was doing some talks in Phoenix in Arizona, and I got this little whisper in my head, why don't you go to Las Vegas? I wonder who that was from. Well, because I was so prideful and arrogant, and I thought I've overcome gambling, I went to Las Vegas, and I was there half a day. And within half a day, I'd done $100 on a roulette table. And I remember to justify my sin, I gave the croupier a little miraculous medal. And I said, our lady loves you. And he looked at me as if I was completely crazy. And as I walked away, I thought, well, maybe that's why I gambled. And I felt God saying, who are you trying to keep? Anyhow, I came out of that casino and I felt totally depleted, like I'd really let God down. 
And I went into this church and there was a statue of Our Lady. And I took out my rosary and I said, I'm that prayer rosary in sorrow for breaking my promise. And I felt her say, no, let me pray with you. And she took her hand and she placed it in the part of my heart where I don't want anyone to see me or anyone to know me. You know, the real dark part of my heart where I don't want to see myself sometimes. And I felt her say, there's nothing new I don't love. There's nothing new I don't cherish. And there's nothing new I don't accept. There's nothing new my son doesn't love. There's nothing new my son doesn't cherish. And there's nothing new my son doesn't accept. I cried and I cried and I cried. And when I walked out of that church, I have never had the desire to gamble again. It's like Our Lady touched that part of my heart, which I was filling with vice. And she touched it with God's love. And immediately it was transformed. And so as I started this talk by praying that we might accept the parts that we don't like about ourselves and really see ourselves through God's eyes, I'm going to finish on that same note. And you know, one of the greatest gifts God's given me is the gift of being able to love. Because when you've spent so many years without love, when you're given that grace to love, it's transforming. Just finally, I spent working with Mother Teresa. I really understood that it's through giving that we receive. So when I came back, I thought I'm gonna start working with the homeless. And I had this lie in my head that anyone who was homeless was either a druggie or a drunk. I remember one of the first guys I met on the streets, I said to him, you should stop taking drugs. He said, I don't take drugs. I said, well then you should stop drinking. He said, I don't drink. And at the time I used to smoke, this is the hypocrite I was. I said, well then you should stop smoking. He said, I don't smoke. He said, do you know what you should do? I said, no. He said, you should stop judging people. He taught me far more than I taught him. Another time I was giving out some sandwiches and I had some ham sandwiches, cheese sandwiches and chicken sandwiches. And I said to this homeless guy, do you want a cheese sandwich? He said, I don't like cheese. I thought the cheek, he's meant to be starving, he doesn't like cheese. Well, he must have known what I was thinking because he said, just because you're homeless and hungry, it doesn't make you like cheese. I thought, good point. So after that, I said, would you like ham, chicken or cheese? And other people we used to help were people who were housebound. One lady was called Winifred. She was a Quaker. And I used to go around and take her out in a wheelchair because she was more or less imprisoned through having leukemia. And each time I'd bring her back into her house, she'd ask me to pray with her before I'd leave. And I'd say a little prayer. And then there was almost like a silence, like she was waiting on the Holy Spirit. On one occasion she prayed. And to my dying day, I'll never forget what it was like praying with Jesus Christ. I visited her the night she died in the hospital and I gave her a rosary. Now remember, she was a Quaker. She said, I know what this is. This is Our Lady's hand, and she'll lead me to Jesus. Do you know she died exactly one hour after I gave her that rosary? Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And other people we used to help were kids who were dying. We used to take them to Lourdes in France. One little boy was called Stephen. He had cancer of the spinal cord. But you even held this little kid in your arms and he'd beam a smile that would melt your heart. And before he'd have one of these terrible spasms where his whole body shook, he'd pucker his lips so that he could kiss me on the side of the face. He taught me more about love than I could ever teach him. But the person I think I was really helping when I was helping those homeless guys 
was a part of my own wounded heart because I know what it's like to not have a home. And when I was visiting Winifred, I was visiting a part of my heart because I know what it's like to be in prison like she was in prison. And when I was holding Stephen in my arms, it was like I was holding a part of my heart in my arms. Because I know what it's like to be 10 and have no one love you. I think it's through giving that we receive in life. And the more I've learned to give, the more I've received. Someone said to me once, when we die, we die in a, a football stadium, even bigger than the Super Bowl. And there in all the terraces, are there'll be all the saints who have gone before us. When someone like Saint Mother Teresa walks through that tunnel, a cheer goes up because of what they've done with their lives. Because when he was hungry, she fed him. When he was naked, she clothed him. When he was in prison, she visited him. When he was thirsty, she gave him a drink. When you walk into the tunnel, what's the response to be of what you've done with your life? I pray you get a greater cheer than even Saint Mother Teresa. See, I don't want to be a saint. A saint is someone who makes it to heaven. I want to be a great saint and I want to bring thousands of souls to God because it's the only thing I've found worth living for and it's the only thing I really believe is worth dying for. Just lastly, I think I've got about a hundred odd books there of my life story. I know some of you got the book last time and those who didn't have the opportunity because you wasn't here there, there's some there. The book's very honest and it's very real. I was in the prison just a few months ago. I like going in the prison now because when I want to leave, they let me out. But there was a time they never used to let me out. But I gave that book to a prisoner who had been in there for 22 years. Three days after reading the book, he fell down at the priest's feet and he asked to become a Catholic. And he's now doing the RCIA. It's very real and it's very honest. I'd say the certificate on the book is a 15. And if anyone wants a copy, I've got about 100 odd copies there. First come, first serve. I'll sign them for you. If anyone wants a copy and hasn't got a chance because there's not enough there, if you ask our good father here, he give him your name and I will send you in a personal signed copy. Now, if you've got, I think the price of the book is $20, but to you it's $10. If you've got $10, all well and good. But if you haven't, then you can pay whenever you get it. So, but please take a book. So if you want a book, please take a book. And if all you can offer me is a prayer, well, that's priceless. So I think I get the better deal. If you can pay, it just goes to our work. I'm in the community. I'm not allowed to earn money. But if you can't pay, please still take a book. My final story is a true story. There's these two farmers, and one of the things they love is showing people around their farm. Well, one of them is away this day, and two priests arrive. So the farmer says to this, these two priests, let me show you my farm. And he takes him to the cornfields, and the priests are very impressed by these acres and acres of corn. And he said, I planted this corn with my own hands. And the priest turns to the other priest and very piously says, God has been very good to him. And then the farmer says, look at my cattle. And there's literally thousands and thousands of cattle all over the fields. And he said, I raised these with my own hands. And the priest very piously turns to the other priest and says, God has been very good to him. And the farmer tucks a bit and he's getting a bit annoyed. And then he says, look at my oats. And there's literally barns and barns full of oats. And he said, I grew these, planted these with my own hands. And the priest very piously turns to the other priest and says, God's been very good to him. 
where the farmer can't take anymore. And he says, you're right, Father. Me and God have got a great farm going here. But you wanted to see the state of this farm when God was running it on his own. The only hands that God has are our hands. The only feet that God has are our feet. I pray that in the words of St. Mother Teresa, we become something beautiful for God and we put him first in our lives and we realise that life is about giving and that's where we receive. So thank you very much for listening so attentively and respectfully. I'll be praying for you. Please pray for me. God bless you and thank you. Let's get a tired clap from Mr. Pridmore.